So this mimer is from the Kutai Torah, Parshas Chukas, and it's discussing the episode where the Jewish people had complained, yet again, about uh, the food they were eating. And they got the offal. And they were attacked by a plague of snakes. Oh. Snakes started biting them. They realized that they'd done something wrong. They called to Moshe. Moshe called to Hashem. And Hashem said to Moshe, make the figure of a copper serpent, a snake, put it on top of a pole and lift it up in the air. And whoever was bitten by a snake should look at the copper serpent and they will live. They'll be healed from the bite of the snake. And so he did. That's exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu did. He built this serpent, which people looked at and were healed as a result. That's the, that's the story in the Torah. So on this, there are many obvious questions. And the, the first and foremost is quoted by a Mishnah. The Mishnah says, what did this snake heal people? Like looking at, looking at a copper serpent healed somebody? What does that sound like? Like a, co- a thing made, a serpent made out of copper, uh-huh. like an idol. Uh-huh. Seems like an idol. They burned it eventually. And and looking and looking at this serpent is going to make people better. How's it possible? How could it be? I mean, it's not an idol because Hashem told <coughs> Moshe to do it. That, that's that's what makes it, that's what makes it not not idolatry. Idolatry is what Hashem said not to do. This Hashem said to do. But still, why would Hashem tell? Moshe to build a, a copper serpent and by looking at it you get healed? That that doesn't seem to make sense. And so the mission in Rosh Hashanah has an answer, which we'll see. We'll see what the answer to that question is. <coughs> okay, so so let's have a look at the Maimon. On, on page 122 there, on the left side at the bottom. The <laughs> Yas so Moshe made a copper serpent. He placed it on the top of a pole. And so it, it was that if the snake, a snake had bitten a person, that person would stare, would gaze at the copper serpent and he would live. It worked. He would live. So the Mishnah asks at the end of the third parak of Rosh Hashanah, on this, on this issue, on this story in the Torah, that the Mishnah says that surely looking at a snake doesn't make you better. A snake doesn't have a, a, a copper serpent doesn't have the power to give you life or healing. So rather, what it really was, says the Mishnah, was that when the Jewish people would look upwards towards heaven, towards their Father in heaven, and they would subjugate their hearts to Him. That's what gave them the healing. So that, that the author is going to ask. So, so, but the mission. What does the mission say? That no, nah, it wasn't. Wasn't looking at the copper serpent that healed you. It was looking into the heavens. <coughs> the copper serpent was just a red herring. The copper serpent was a red herring. It, it was just something to, to make you look in, in the right direction, look upwards to heaven, and by looking up to heaven, you were you were healed. Turning to Hashem. So the Altarabah asks again the obvious so question. Why do, you the need kasha, why do you need a snake at all then? It should be that if you were bitten by a snake, you stuck a clap in my Look up. Well, Moshe couldn't tell them the direction to look. He couldn't tell them to look up. You needed a snake to look up. They wouldn't look up otherwise. Seems, seems ridiculous. No, they needed to fear the snake. That's not what it says. It says by looking up and seeing Hashem and looking up, uh, 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 subjugating the heart to Hashem, they were healed, not by the snake. So, so what's what's going on here? Not only that, the Altarebbe asks another question. What's the idea that by looking upwards, specifically, the snake had to be put on the top of a pole so they would look upwards, subjugate their hearts to, have, to heaven, and they would be healed? Why did they have to look afterwards? It says in the laws of davening, that you should have your eyes facing downwards and your heart upwards. This is what it says in halacha that when you daven, 
You should have them facing upwards with your heart. But your eyes should be looking down. Why? You look down at the what if, even if you're not, even if you're not off by heart, it's not, it's not, I mean obviously if you need to read, you need to read, but even if you don't need to read, you should have your eyes down. Why? Humble. That's, that's humble. Yeah, correct. It's humble to look down. To have your head looking upwards is a is haughty, arrogant. You look downwards, but your heart should be directed upwards to Hashem. But you're, you're face down. I mean, it's true, looking into the Siddur is also a very important thing. Yeah, it they, is. When they work that. They and, and the truth is, even if you do know it off by heart, to look into the Siddur is a very, very important thing. <laughs> and you can try this, by the way. Those of us who have trouble davening, which is everybody, <laughs> uh, <laughs> if, you, if you daven by looking into the Siddur and not looking out of the Siddur, it's an amazing experience. It's worth trying. Thanks. Try, try one davening where you don't look up from the Siddur. It's torture. But it's a, it's a totally, it's a totally yeah, different experience. <laughs> so anyway, Halacha says you don't put your, your, your eyes upwards, you put your eyes downwards when you're davening. Whereas here, it says in the Mishnah that because they looked upwards, they put their eyes upwards, they were healed. That's not the way to daven. So, so these questions, Lahavenzeh, to understand this, Naktim Lachker, Be'inyan Ridus and Hashama Ba'olam Hazer. We have to first investigate the very reason why the soul came down into this world. Which, by the way, this the Alter Rebbe does almost every mimer. Whatever the question is, we have to think, well, okay, they're good questions. Let's understand why the soul came into, the, into this world <laughs> in the first place. And through that, we will understand this particular issue. So, so to understand this episode of the snake and the whole thing, we have to understand why the Neshama came down into this world in the first place. The main purpose of the soul coming into this world is, is to connect with Hashem to have love and fear. To have a love for Hashem, an awe for Hashem, to have an emotional connection with Hashem. This is what our soul seeks and this is what we're in this world to do. To connect with Hashem. And the time and the time in our lives, when we actually experience this connection, the, the time when this happens is in davening. That's the main time. There are other times you can, can, can connect to Hashem, but the main time you connect to Hashem, you feel that connection, that dveikus, is in davening. Because the words you say in davening are, are words that you can understand, you can relate to. Unlike when you do a mitzvah, a mitzvah to understand that a mitzvah is connecting you to Hashem requires somewhat of a meditation. You have to, you have to think about that. Whereas to understand that davening is connecting you to Hashem is more direct. Because what is davening? It's talking to Hashem. The words you're saying are you Hashem, Baruch Atah Hashem. Like, it's more directly connecting with Hashem. And so while lighting candles or shaking a lulav or giving tzedakah or putting up a mezuzah, all these things are connecting you with Hashem. Davening is a more direct dveikus, an emotional relationship with Hashem. Because the words that you're saying are words of love, of connection. Like it's, uh, it's stuff that you could actually understand. But what does it mean when we stand there like bored and not wanting to do it? Like does Hashem take that into account or is it just good that we say it? It's still good to say it, but that's the struggle of davening. That's, that's, that's what it is. So... So the fact that it's a struggle doesn't take away from it. That's, that's the point. Now, Ubavade, the Alter Rebbe points out, certainly, before the soul came down to this world, and so too, after a, the soul leaves the body and leaves this world, surely it connects, the soul connects far deeper with Hashem. The love and the fear that the soul experienced before it came into this world and will experience after it leaves this world is far deeper, far more profound and real than it does during your lifetime. Why? Why would that be? Because the body doesn't let you serve Hashem, like you just said. 
Davening is connecting with Hashem. That's nice. But your body, in the meantime, is blocking your connection with Hashem and, and telling you that you're bored or you're hungry or you're tired or there's other things to do. It gets in the way. So the entire time that the soul inhabits a body, it connects to Hashem through davening. Nice. But that's nothing compared to the connection the soul had before it was in the body and will have after it's in the body when it doesn't have the body in the way. on the contrary, machmas chumro lehonas af That the coarseness, the vulgarity of the body is such that it forces the soul to get involved with materialism. Not only does the body not stay out of the way and let the soul connect to Hashem, the body gets in the way, distracts the soul, and, and drags us into materialism, into physical things. So the entire time that the soul is, is, is within the body, it's distracted from godliness. And even if you do daven every now and then, what a struggle it is. And how much do you really daven when you're davening? And how connected are you really? How much love and fear do you engender in, in, in within yourself when you're davening? But the Altar was talking to people who really did daven. And this generation was known for the davening. And, and even they, before, when their soul didn't have a body, had it much easier. Yeah, that's true. Even though the soul is totally not interested in anything Gashmias. The soul has no interest whatsoever in the material world, in the physical world. Because the soul is a piece of Hashem. And all the soul wants was, is to be more and more connected to Hashem. That's, that's the soul's interest in life. But nevertheless, the soul is stuck in a body. And distracted by the body. So what sense is it to say that the whole reason why we came down into this world is to connect to Hashem? That makes no sense at all. If connecting to Hashem is the idea, you were better off before you came to the world. You don't need to come here to do that. On the contrary, coming here makes it harder. This world and the, and the body gets in the way. So... We're back to our question. Why did the soul come into this world? So if you know the Zoyar, the Zoyar explains. The Zoyar says, somebody who does not transform bitterness to sweetness has no part in this world whatsoever. But the Zoyar uses very dramatic terminology, generally. <laughs> doesn't mince words or, you know, PC, polite, you know, saying, look, we're all good, but, you know, you should really... The Zohar puts it straight yeah, as it is. Hmm? You're good, you're good, it's fine. No, the, uh, the Maimur the also doesn't always do that, but uh, the Zohar certainly does not. The Zohar says, somebody who does not transform bitterness to sweetness has no place in this world. What does that mean? We're just after those small print brackets. The human being was created just for this, to transform bitterness to sweetness. In other words, it's true, the soul is better off as it is in heaven, without the distraction of the body. So why does the soul come down into a body? To transform the bitterness of the body, the darkness, the distraction that the body provides, to transform that into sweetness, into a connection with Hashem. Indeed, the soul is better off before it came down into this world. That's true. But it, it, what the soul does not have before coming into this world is the opportunity to transform, to turn around darkness to light, bitterness to sweet. And so the connection that we have with Hashem as a result of us participating in His project of expanding the realm of holiness that even this dark, lowly world should also be included in the holiness of Hashem. The closeness that we receive as a result of that, that's something that you can't have in heaven. The soul couldn't have before it came into this body. And so when we say we came into this world to connect with Hashem, what it means is to connect to Hashem in this world, in, in, in the darkness of this world, through the, the blockage that the body provides. Can I just ask, is yeah? this the first time pretty much we're hearing any of this? Like with this mimer, I mean, it's something we 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 kind of no, no, no so this is not the first the time. Rebbe, this oh, you was mean before the Alter Rebbe, this was taught? 
I mean, this was a Zayar, he's quoting the Zayar. And everything the Alter Rebbe uh, teaches, he quotes sources from before. But, but Hasidus brought about a certain emphasis or a certain approach to things that was not necessarily noticed and beforehand. This is the beginning of it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. It's not that this mimer is the first time no, the idea is no. mentioned, but the Alter Rebbe was, was the one who, who really promoted this idea. And sorry, but when they say Baal Shem Tov was that he started the Hasidish, yeah. Hasidish movement, yeah. it's not this, it's... You can, find, you can find kernels of these ideas in the right. Baal Shem Tov, but yeah. the Baal Shem Tov didn't write volumes of right. teachings. Okay. The Alter Rebbe expanded and made a, made a, whole, a whole philosophy out of it. Hmm. Are you oh. hearing? Yes. <laughs> oh gosh, where is she? Does this slide go into how to transform bitterness into sweetness? Yes. It's a okay. function, yes, it will. We're going to go into that now. God willing. I don't know, now, later in the mimer it will. As long as the connection stays good. <laughs> okay. So, so the, the point of our soul coming into this world, and this, I mean, this already is a is a point to absorb. The point of, of our soul coming to this world is to transform bitterness to sweet. Meaning the the bitterness means the the blockage, the that which opposes holiness and godliness, where our job is to transform it. So don't be surprised if you have to face bitterness, like that it, it's difficult. That, that's what we're here for. If if we just be in the world to connect with Hashem, we could have done that in heaven without any impediment, without any blockage, no effort, no difficulties, no temptations, nothing pulling us away from it. We came into the world to transform the darkness. So it's going to be difficult, like every step of the way. There is going to be a reason not to do it. And that is why you were created. We That's what you're here for. transform the bitterness in our lives. Transform the bitterness to sweet. Did you say how good attitude? More than have a good attitude. It, mean, it means it means that overcoming that which seems to be dragging you down and allow it to propel you upwards. Mm-hmm. Allow it to propel you upwards, or sometimes maybe whatever's dragging you down, you can't allow it at all. It just true. There's 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 two there's two ways you have to deal with these blockages. Sometimes you have to ignore them or just. Separate. Yeah, like d- disconnect from them, and, uh, but sometimes it's actually turning it around. Right. Depends on what level and what circumstance. Yeah. And, yeah. But either way, the blockages are expected. Mm-hmm. It's it's expected to be hard to to serve Hashem. That's why we're here. Otherwise, if it was supposed to be easy, we would stay in heaven. So, easy. so on the fifth last line of the page, Shari Babais Rishon Loi Hoi Misbalim Klal. So we see historically, in the times of the first temple, the first base of Mikdash, they didn't daven. Davening was not a real thing. Even in the second temple times, there was only a short amount of davening at that time. Right, the first temple, the davening was not a, not a thing. That wasn't that wasn't the way to serve Hashem. It wasn't the avodah. In the second temple, also there was a, not much davening. Now, certainly, they also in those times had the same avodah, the avodah of transforming bitterness to sweetness. So why didn't they daven? <laughs> Meaning, when when is the time that you transform bitterness to sweetness? When it's bitter. In davening, that's what davening is. Davening is the, the, the collision between this world and the higher world. That is actually where it all happens. So what's mitzvahs? Hmm? What's mitzvahs? Mitzvahs also, but davening is more directly that way. Do you mean structured davening or just talking to God? The structured davening. The davening every day. It can also be talking to God, but davening meaning serving Hashem. Davening not, not meaning asking Hashem what you want. I'm talking about davening, meaning connecting to Hashem. So you're saying the transforming from bitterness to sweetness is happening during davening? Yeah. That's where the biggest clash of holiness and, and unholiness is. Because you, w- when you're davening, you cannot escape the dichotomy in your soul. 
when you do a mitzvah, so you can just do the mitzvah, and what's going on in your heart, in your mind, is not so relevant. You just do the mitzvah, and you, you, you've done it. When you learn Torah, so your spiritual state at the time you learn Torah, you can put it aside and just, just zone in and, and learn Torah. When you daven, you can't escape who you are spiritually. Because davening is Avodah Shabalev. It's your heart connecting with Hashem. So, this is why davening is the most confronting of all spiritual activities. Because you can't, you can't hide behind anything when you're davening. Either it's happening or it's not happening. And, and when you try to daven, when you try to spiritually uplift a little bit in davening, so immediately all of the powers of the Nefesh Bahamis, the animal soul, come tumbling down upon you, and every distractive, distracting thought happens, and every urge and itch and anything that you've ever experienced comes to you to try and drag you away from the davening. And you can't concentrate, and you can't focus, and nothing works. Why is that happening? Because davening is revealing your connection with Hashem in in a, in, a, in, a, in a real emotional, personal way. So is that Nefesh trying to fight that? So the Nefesh is yeah, and like it says in Tanya, the sign that you're davening is real davening, is that you have distracting thoughts. That's 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 the litmus test. <laughs> if you're if you're davening, you don't. That means you're not even there. It's not that the Nefesh is not there. You're not even there. What happens if you don't even have a focus thought? What if you're in a good mood and you just want to dive in? Try it, see what happens. <laughs> I have to check my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so when people say they don't have distractions during davening, then... They're probably not davening. Not davening or they're lying. Yeah, they're probably, yeah. If, if someone can really say that they can, they can daven and not have distractions, like totally focus on it, they're probably no, so not aware that they're even davening that they're not even aware <laughs> of the distracting thoughts. What probably. if that, if your beginning to end is just so, I don't know, just so not present that you don't notice a distraction? Right, that's what I'm saying. You're, you so you're so not present, so, this, so you didn't daven. Right, but then couldn't you also say that that's um, the Nefesh of Bahamas distracting you? Couldn't you say that's one big distraction? Yes. Yeah, so, you, so are, are they being distracting? Being, being distracted. Completely opposite things. One is that you didn't daven at all, like you kind of didn't daven, and the other is that your davening is so strong that your nefesh bahamas distracted you so completely. No, no, no. If if you're not davening at all, then the nefesh bahamas doesn't have to fight. The nefesh bahamas has got you. There's no. Yeah. I'm talking about if you daven, but once you finished. You like if you if you if you um, have daven and then say, did I daven? Today, so then you didn't dub. No. No. I don't understand how this, um, how dubbing is more of a connecting between this sort. Like with a mitzvah, you actually are doing something physical with this world. Like dubbing is just focused. So how is it more of a connecting soul to body than a mitzvah? What it means here is that what does a connection mean a connection means two entities two beings relating to each other now two beings relating to each other means both sides are relating to each other not just one sided but both sides are relating to each other so for something to relate to you it has to relate to you the, the being that you are now a mitzvah does relate to you in that a mitzvah you do with your body and with your being but the idea that the mitzvah you're doing is connecting with Hashem that idea itself is something that we believe, we sense, we know, but you can't, you can't trace it. You can't see it. It's not, it's not obvious. There's, there's no obvious connection between shaking a lulav and connecting to Hashem. There's not, there's not a, an obvious thing that you can trace, that you can see, this is connected. We know it is because Hashem asked you to do it. Whereas in davening, davening is relating to you. You are saying words to Hashem. You're speaking to Hashem. You're having a conversation with Hashem. You're serving him with your heart. So it's it's very obviously a relationship with Hashem. In in your terms, in human terms, that's what a relationship is. Having a conversation, feeling emotion. So it's more directly a connection to Hashem for you. Because a connection means both sides feeling a bond.
Maybe also like with the mitzvah, we bring godliness down into this world more than we elevate the physical thing, which we do also, but it's more bringing godliness down, whereas with davening, we elevate, it's like more we meet in the middle. Yeah, yeah. Like we've discussed many times how with a mitzvah, your intention or feeling or focus, all these things are secondary to the mitzvah. The main thing is to do the mitzvah correctly. So whether you feel it or not, whether you're in the mood or not, whether you're inspired or understand, or that, that is all secondary to doing the mitzvah itself, the act of the mitzvah. That's talking about mitzvah. But when it comes to davening, the mitzvah of davening, the act of davening is to feel a connection with Hashem. So you need to be much more involved. Your involvement in a mitzvah could be mechanical and you've done the mitzvah. Your involvement with davening can't be mechanical. It's, it's an emotional bond. It's a void of serving Hashem with your heart. So when you daven and you feel distracting thoughts coming to you and you're all over the place and you overcome them, you stop those distracting thoughts and say, no, now I'm not going to deal with that. Now I'm davening. And you go back to the davening. Every time you do that, you're transforming bitterness to sweetness. You're overcoming a little bit of your bitterness. Bitterness here means your, your animal soul, your body and all its distractions. Every time you go back to the davening, you're transforming a little bit of yourself. You're, you're weakening your bodily, your, your, your animalistic side. And that's the victory of davening. That's the exercise of davening. You're, there's a certain muscle being exercised when you daven, and that is getting back to the davening. So every time there's a, there's a, a thought, you go back to it. And, and you strengthen yourself a little bit more. You've transformed another bit, another bit of bitterness. Just you know, it could space be space and time or forever? No, no, forever. You've conquered another level of self. Forever? Yeah. I mean, on a deeper level, you might have to do it again, you know, but, but yeah, you've, you've taken a step. There's a certain unholiness that you've overcome. And so it could be the weirdest thoughts come up during davening of things that from years and years ago that you thought you'd forgotten but now they come up in, in, in davening. I see. So when, when that happens, we're, we're quite disturbed by it. We thought we, we thought we forgot that one, and now, now this came back to us. But we should actually embrace that. This is fantastic. This is my chance to bop it on the head. There's, there's, been, there's this bitterness, this ugliness that is in me that has been sitting there for many years. Now, now I'm davening, and it pops up. I have a chance to, to cut, it, cut it off. It might still come up again a few times, but eventually... You, you've conquered that bit of bitterness. So that's what davening is. It's, this is when we're transforming bitterness this week. What if your thoughts aren't like you related to davening? What if the thoughts are, are basically you're reading, like you're going to Sean Esra and you're like, oh, that's really great. I want to be in Jerusalem, but don't really connect to that. Don't really understand that enough. Wonder, that doesn't really connect to me. Why do I have to say that every day? Like... Like it's related to davening, it's the extraneous thought. Right, so that, that probably is a more refined Nefesh Bahamas. That, that the animal soul knows that it can't distract you by making you think about the weather or something else. So it's going to ask you, yeah, on the davening itself, what's, uh, you know, what does that mean? And so you start thinking about the davening, but that, was, that itself was to distract you. Why say that, or what's the difference? So, I don't what connect you, to that. How's that connecting me to Hashem? Okay. I don't have any good feelings about that. So, what, so what you should say is, good question, but now this is not a shir, this is davening. This is not learning, I'm not reading a book, I'm davening from the Siddur. So it's a good question, it's a, it's a valid point. What, what's, what's, what's the meaning of this? But, but now's not the time to debate, now's, now's the time to daven. Do you know what I mean? Whereas the Nefesh Bahamas is quite happy to get you into a, a philosophical... Uh, yeah. Sorry, if you're not supposed to be thinking about that, what are you supposed to be thinking about? Sure. The words you say. And if you don't understand what you're saying? Say it in English. You should understand. Well, I'm asked, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, in your opinion, um, is there a difference between dubbing in English or in Hebrew? There is a difference between dubbing in English and dubbing in Hebrew. The difference is the Hebrew is a holy language. Even if you don't understand it, it's still holy. But, but... Still, the point of davening is to understand what you're saying. And so it's better for most of davening, it's better to daven in English and understand it um, than to daven in Hebrew and not understand. However, better than that is to daven in Hebrew and understand. 
And so it's worth learning line by line the davening and slowly increasing more and more saying Hebrew because the Hebrew has a power that the English doesn't have. But understanding is the most important part. Okay. All right. So just on that, when you say understanding, when you're talking about like offering sacrifices, right? Um, and we know that we do that to repent for our sins because we can't actually offer sacrifices. Do we think about the sacrifices we offer? Think about our the sins that we know about that we've done. Like, do we think about what we're sorry for? Uh, when you're saying the vidui, you're confessing sins, you think about the sins, and you think about like that's that's the time for confessing confession. Right, and it's okay. So. So the Alter Rebbe says here, well, hang on a minute. If davening is the time of transforming the bitterness to sweetness, which is the whole point of our existence here in this world, so then why was it in the times of the Besamekdash they didn't do it? They actually didn't daven in the first Besamekdash. And in the second Besamekdash, hardly yet, uh, either. They gave Kabbalah's instead. Oh, so so, so how, how and why and what's the connection? So... On the third last line of the page, the idea is this. There's a rule in spirituality that says that the harsh judgments, the dinim, become sweetened in their source. Meaning, when you want to sweeten, when you want to transform bitterness to sweetness, you can't work on the externals to make it sweet. You have to go to the inner aspect, the, the internal to, ch- to turn it around. When you want to make a change, when you want to take negative energy and make it into positive energy, it can't be a cosmetic change where you just change its look. You have to go into its source, into its energy, where it comes from, and rewire it from there, and then you can change bitterness to sweetness. Again, the, the words is adinim nimtokim b'sharsham, the harsh judgments, bitterness, to be sweetened has to be sweetened in its source. We'll explain. Dine. Kol rois v'dinim rachmano etzlan. Shnes avo ba'olam. All evil that there is in the world. All negative energy. Harsh judgment. Every, every negative power there is in the world. Nisavo ba'olam. Shersham umakoram hamachayo esam hutoiv. The source and root that gives them life is good. Again, all powers of evil, all powers of negativity that there are in the world, their source is positive, is goodness, is holiness. Commercial has in Ben like the metaphor of the prostitute and the prince. Hamavur Bazayar, that is brought in the Zayar. Do you remember the prostitute and the prince? Ever does. Yeah. <laughs> you said it once before, that's the only reason why I know it. Yeah. <laughs> I remember it from last time. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a very powerful metaphor. It's from the Zoyar. The Zoyar gives the metaphor. So, I'll just quickly uh, go over. What's the, what's the metaphor? The metaphor is of a king who has a son who's eventually going to be the next king. And this prince has grown up in the royal palace with all the best... Uh, amenities around him, the best food and the best lifestyle and best teachers and and this child has had a lap of luxury, a wonderful, wonderful kid who seems to be a very worthy heir to the throne. However, the king is concerned that maybe the reason why my child is so good and sweet and and, uh, talented is because he's had it so easy. He's never been tested. I don't know if he really has a deep seated moral fiber. I think he just does the right thing because he's never had to have any choices. And so the father wants to test his son to see if he really is such a good person. So the king hires a prostitute and tells her, I want, I want you to try and seduce my son. And uh, your job is to use all of your powers of seduction to to seduce him to sin with you. Because I want to see if he is up to the task. 
So, so the Zoya points out, and the Alter Rebbe here explains, that this, this woman is in an unbelievable position. She, on the one hand, has to do her best to make the prince sin. That's her job. That's what she's been hired to do. If she is successful in doing that, if she does cause this prince to sin with her, so she's done her job, will the king be happy? No. No. S why? Because his son has failed. So what if she doesn't do her job? What if she half-heartedly seduces him? She doesn't, she doesn't use all of her powers of seduction and, and she doesn't do a good job. Will the, will the king be happy? Also not. So how will the king be happy with her? If, if she does everything she can to tempt the prince and she fails. Not because she didn't try, because he overcame her, her temptation. So her, her job is a very subtle thing. She, she cannot in any way let on that she doesn't mean it. She can't be insincere in, in her seduction because then she's not doing her job. On the other hand, she internally does not want to succeed. She doesn't want him to listen. And it's very difficult to convince somebody of something when you don't want them to be convinced of it. To sound convincing when you don't really want them want the person to be convinced. That's a very difficult position to be in. And yet this is the position that this woman is in. So the Zohar says that this is the position of Satan, of, of Satan, of, of the powers of evil. They are hired by the king, Hashem, to test the prince, which is us, to see if we can overcome the challenge. And so the powers of evil, they're job is to throw everything they can at us to make us do the wrong thing. But they themselves, the powers of evil themselves, Satan, the evil inclination, they know that if they're successful, Hashem's not happy at anybody. Hashem won't be happy with them, not with us. It's, it's not what Hashem wants. What Hashem wants is for them to fail. But they have to do their best. Are we sure that they don't want to do it? Like, are we sure that it's a struggle for them to, to try and do it? So, we'll see in the Mimer that there's sort of there's sort of two levels in them. Like with with the with the Zona with this woman as well. There's there's her as in her relationship with the king, and there's her in her relationship with the prince, and she actually has to divide those two up. As far as the king is concerned, she wants to fail. As far as the prince is concerned, she wants to be successful. And so she has to divide her, psycho her psyche in a way and really want the prince to sin. Even though when she was, was in the presence of the king, she would not have wanted that. Mm. But she has to in the presence of the prince, she has to. In a similar way, Satan, as we deal with Satan, is really evil and really wants to get us. But in the source, where, where, where Satan was engaged by Hashem to, to fulfill a mission, so Satan is not against God. Satan is a servant of Hashem. Let's look in the words of the Rebbe. Top line of the, of the page, after the small brackets. Shekal Ritzon of the so going back to the woman. The prostitute, her entire desire, shaloi letzayis osa, is that the prince should not listen to her. Or she will be more satisfied. She'll be much happier if the prince does not listen to her. Shateauva lamelech, because then the king will love her. Why will the king love her? Because she did a great job and she failed. That's exactly what the king wanted. So the king will pay her double for failing. But if she'd be successful in seducing the prince, but Tucholoi, and she conquers him, that's not really what the king wanted. She's doing what the king asked, but that's not what the king wants. It's what he wants on a certain level, but 
That's yeah. He does it, This is what he does not want to happen. So, mezel maim razal. That's what it means. In the, the Gemara says, "Satan or Penina l'shem shemaim nischavnu," that Satan and Penina had pure intentions. So who's Penina? Penina is yeah, Chana's sister. Chana in Tanakh was uh, not blessed with children. Her sister Penina was, and Penina made a bit of fun, was mean to her sister Chana. Why did she do that? She wanted to arouse her to, to daven more. She saw that she was being complacent. She wasn't. She wasn't. It wasn't bothering her enough. So Penina was not nice to her in order to arouse her. So, she was doing it to, to arouse her to pray. So, Penina meant, meant L'shem Shemaim. Satan also. Satan comes and tempts us to do the wrong thing, tries to get us to sin, but L'shem Shemaim, because that's Satan's job. At the same time, Ubuakum Akher Amru, the very same sages of the Gemara, say in another place, Nasan Enob B'mikdash Rishon Bechrivai, that Satan, set his sights on the temple and caused it to be destroyed. Meaning, Satan didn't want the temple to, to exist because temple is holiness in the world. And so the Satan will, um, worked his way into the Jewish people, caused them to sin in order that the temple should be destroyed. Meaning, the sages are describing Satan here as a vicious, evil power trying to bring down holiness. But the same sages say, but Satan does it the Shem Shemayim. When the Satan tries to destroy the Bezim Mikdash, he's doing his job. That's what he's supposed to be doing. But hang on a minute. It, it, it sounds more like he really has vicious intentions here. He saw the Bezim Mikdash and wants it to be destroyed. It doesn't just say that like, Look, his job is to try and make us do the wrong thing. He doesn't want the Basimikta should be destroyed. No, this is talking about his plans. Satan planned that the Basimikta should be destroyed, so he went out to get us. So how can you say it's L'shem Shemayim? It doesn't say he wanted the Basimikta to be rebuilt. He wanted to be destroyed. So for Inyinhu, the idea is this. The source of evil that gives it life is actually good. Kimvur Bezosham just like the Zoyar there, after giving this metaphor of the woman and the prince, the, the prostitute and the prince, it, it says there the, the, this idea that the source of evil is actually, that gives it life is actually good. Can you have a servant that goes against the master? It, it wouldn't make sense. Satan is no more than a servant of Hashem. And a servant cannot have any power outside of the master's power. Okay, the truth is, we do see servants who do rebel against their masters. But that's talking about a human master and a human servant. A human servant can rebel against his master because he's flesh and blood. And so the servant was not created by the master. The servant doesn't get his life force from the master. He's a separate entity, so he can rebel. But servants of Hashem, the angels, including Satan and all angels of evil, who receive their power directly from Hashem, their existence, their life force is from Hashem. Because Hashem gives everything existence. How could there possibly be an angel that rebels against Hashem? Their existence is purely from Hashem. There's no thought that an angel can have, no energy an angel can have that's independent of Hashem. Hashem gave it that existence and that thought. So how can there possibly be an angel that, that rebels against the Shek, Hashem, including Satan? So the Zohar explains, So that's why the Zohar uses this metaphor of the Zohar and the Ben the prostitute and the prince, to illustrate that you can have a servant of the king doing something that is actually against the will of the king, but that's what the king asked the servant to do. In other words, the Satan has, has been put into this very precarious situation where 
Satan's whole mission is to try and counter the force of God in the world. And who gave him that mission? God. So the zil, hmm? Sorry, I just, uh, I'm a little bit, I know that it's supposed to be a little bit hard for us, but I think with relationships in general, we don't try and test each other. Like if you've got a friendship or you've got a relationship, whatever it is, and it's good, you, you don't need to test it to make sure that it's good. Why does Hashem need to test us? Why does the father need to test his son? Why can't there be a trust and an understanding that it is good? So there's, there's two types of test. There's a test to see what is, and there's a test to bring out something that is only in potential, but isn't there yet. I think that the second one is why. Why do that? Because to, to create something, well, that, that's the purpose of creation, is to extend the boundaries of holiness. So um, if I, if I, it's not that Hashem is not sure whether we're going to pass or not. So therefore he tests us. It's that he wants us to extend ourselves, to, to go further than we are already. The, the, whole, the whole point of, of our creation is that we are beings who can face evil and overcome it. And by doing that we extend Hashem's power in the world. So in, in the metaphor of the prince and the prostitute as well, it's not just that now we see that the prince can overcome these temptations. Now he, now he has done that. It, it wasn't there before. He hadn't experienced that before. Now you've, you've extended the prince's personality. He's a deeper person now. He's a more real person. His goodness is more real now. Is that the reason for tests of Abraham? To get him on that level? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't just to see if he's going to pass, it's, it's, it was for him to experience that. That's why the word for test in Hebrew, Nisayan, comes from the word nace, which means to lift up. Like the pole that the snake was on was called a nace. To be lifted up, to be elevated to a higher place. Every time you're tested, your powers are brought to the fore and you're, you're higher than you were before. So unlike a, um, unlike a test of knowledge, where, where somebody tests to see how much you know. Well, you know it already, but they just don't know it. You know, you need to be tested by, a, by a, a school because they don't know whether you know it or not. They're seeing if you know it. That's not what these tests are. These tests are that you haven't revealed this power yet. And until you're tested, you won't. So you'll take it to a higher level. It's just hard, like on a deeper level, the, the king doesn't know his son's capabilities and it is expressed in the design that his son faces. So you could say that like that, that, or you could you could say differently. You could say, maybe maybe the king knows the son's capabilities, but he wants it to come to the fore. He wants his son to grow up. He knows that as long as my son is living in this okay. ivory tower, in this palace, he's not going to grow up. So he may have this wonderful personality, but it's not going to be developed until it's forced to be. So I need to, I need to put him in that situation. It's, it may not just be to see if, if he'll pass the test. It's for him to, to grow. It kind of makes me think that shouldn't he have started this from when his son was a little boy and input, like done it gradually. The, the way I'm thinking about it is it's just mean. I think it's mean. I think it's like... <laughs> Maybe he did. Maybe he did this all, all, all along. This was just one episode. Right. I mean, in the end, it's only a metaphor. Let's not take it too personally or get too angry at this particular king. <laughs> but, um, I still don't understand the point about how you said before that the base of English was actually destroyed. Like, goodness is actually destroyed. It wasn't just a matter of... Yeah, cause, because the problem is, the problem is, if the prince listens to the, the prostitute, if he is seduced by her, right. that's going to cause real problems. It's going to get messy. <laughs> right? If he doesn't listen to her, she's done her job and he's done his job and everything's fine. If he does listen to her and falls for it, yeah. 
then he's he's actually stuffed up and there's going to be problems there's going to be consequences it's, it's going to make a mess so the same with us that the satan is there purely as a force to overcome when you overcome it you fulfilled your mission you've been elevated you go to a higher place everything's fine when you don't when you listen to the satan the yetzahara and you and you actually do the wrong thing you've now created evil you've made evil more than it really is it was just something to overcome and you've actually done it now so that makes a mess it causes problems so that's what it's saying here in the source it's goodness but as it's revealed as it's presented to you it's evil if you listen to it so then you've given you've given legs to that evil you've made it you've made it into an a, a true entity in other words was this woman was she really a prostitute in this story no in this story she was a, a servant of the king doing the king's bidding but if the prince falls for her he's made her into a prostitute So in other words, the powers of evil themselves have a good source. They pre- as they are down here, they're presented as evil and because th- they're doing their job. When you overcome evil, so then everyone's doing what they're supposed to do. Evil is tempting you, you're overcoming it. But when you do evil, then you've stuffed up the whole system. Now you've made evil into a real entity. You've given it a presence in the world. That's not what Hashem wanted. What this metaphor in the Zohar is trying to illustrate is the position that evil has to, uh, for us to understand the psychology of Satan. That down here, Satan is purely evil. In its source, Satan is good, doing his job, a, a servant of Hashem. So let's do a couple more lines, then we'll stop. So any evil power there is in the world, its source that enlivens it above is good. But when that evil entity travels down into this world, through the various levels of Ishtalshlus, the whole evolution of worlds, until it reaches down here, it becomes really evil and it is really bad. So Satan down here, the way the Satan we deal with, wants to destroy the base of Mikdash. Has evil intentions, wants to pull us down and destroy us. There's no, you can't look at the Satan in the eye, wink at him and say, don't worry, I know you're on my side. No, Satan down here wants to get you. Your evil inclination wants to get you. As it is down here. It's it's ragom of a dinim gemurim, hen bemila de alma and bemila de shmaya, whether it be in worldly matters or in spiritual matters. Meaning, and this is where the Maimer takes a, a little turn, which we'll we'll see, that this applies both in our spiritual life and also in our physical life. Meaning, in our spiritual life, the powers of evil that try to bring us down. As far as we are concerned, they are really evil and they are really trying to bring us down. In their source, they're actually holy and good. But as it's translated down here with what we face, it is evil that we have to battle. The same applies to things that happen to us in this world. Bad things happen to us in this world. In life, bad things happen. But there's no force outside of Hashem. So even the bad things that happen in this world are really coming from... Hashem from a good source as they are down here they're really bad as they are in their source they're really good and that that idea will be elaborated upon God willing next week